The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the book of the Acts of the Apostles in the second chapter and verses 22 and 23. Verses 22 and 23 in the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. We are met together this morning to look at this great, mighty, momentous fact, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross on Calvary's hill. We are but a small company. There are many similar companies doing this in various parts of the world and have been doing so regularly for many centuries. Now the vital question, therefore, for all of us to consider is this. Why do we do this? What is the meaning of this? We'll all agree that we should not do anything simply out of habit or of custom or simply because it has been done in the past. What is the meaning of this day and of this death which took place on a cross on a hill called Calvary? nearly 2,000 long years ago. What is its meaning? It's essential we should ask the question because it's obvious to all of us that there are many who realize that this, in a sense, has no meaning at all to many people. They talk about Good Friday, but they don't know why it's good. They talk about the death and the cross, they may hold up a cross. They may have a cross in their homes or in their churches. But if you ask them to tell you what exactly this means, what it represents, they won't be able to tell you. There are others who have wrong and false explanations which are not uh, consistent with the teaching of the Holy Word of God. Therefore, it is essential that we should consider this. I know there is a sense in which as one looks at and contemplates the cross, one can do nothing but stand in amazement and in utter astonishment. There is that element. But what I'm trying to say is this, that we shall never know that astonishment and amazement until we understand something of the meaning. It is as the result of surveying the wondrous cross that Isaac Watts goes on to say what he says in his well-known hymn. It wasn't a casual glance. It wasn't a, a thoughtless looking. He surveys it, by which he means that he has been contemplating it and meditating upon it, and thereby has come to understand something of the richness of its meaning. And you and I must do the same thing this morning. Now, according to the first Christian preachers, this event on the cross on Calvary's hill is in many ways the most crucial and vital event that has ever happened. The Apostle Paul in his preaching said that he had determined not to know anything among them save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And it's quite clear that the Apostle Peter uh, here uh, was doing exactly the same thing. To Christian people, there is nothing more important than this. The Apostle again says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Nothing at all, irrelevant, doesn't mean anything, as is the case with so many people in the world today. The preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto us which are saved, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. Now our 
Question, therefore, which we every one of us should ask ourselves at this moment is simply this. Does the cross mean that to us? Is it to us everything? The power of God. The wisdom of God. Is it the whole basis of our life this morning? Is it the thing on which we rely in every respect? Can we say that the cross has separated us from everything we ever were? Can we say this morning that it is this that separates us, crucifies us from everything that belongs to and is denoted under the heading of the world? Well, now, it's obvious that as this is the way in which it is described by the apostles and as it was thus that they preached this, nothing is more important to us who call ourselves Christians than that we should understand and be able to tell others what exactly was happening when this blessed person was crucified on that cross on Calvary's hill. Well, very fortunately, we need be in no doubt at all about this. I'm calling your attention to these words because we have here the explanation that was given by the Apostle Peter. Now, this is most interesting. This is the first sermon that was ever, in a sense, preached under the auspices of the Christian church. Here is the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit had just descended upon them. Before that, you remember, he and the others were confused, in trouble, didn't understand. But now the Holy Ghost has come, and filled with the Holy Ghost, they begin to speak in other tongues and to show unusual manifestations, and the crowd gathers together, amazed and astonished, saying, What is this? Some said, These men are filled with new wine. No, no, says Peter. And then he begins to preach. And here he deals with, in these verses with the meaning of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross on Calvary's hill. Here, then, we have our authority. What matters is not what you and I may think, not what modern writers may think or say. The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And here is the leading apostle preaching the first sermon under the auspices of the Christian church and explaining and expounding what exactly it was that happened when Jesus of Nazareth was crucified on that cross on Calvary's hill. Here is our authority. The first great statement. Let's look at it. I merely want to comment on it. The first thing we notice is this, that there is obviously an element of mystery about it. In other words, you cannot understand the meaning of this cross if you but take a casual glance at it. Because there are elements in it that turn it into a mystery. Our very text suggests that. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked ends have crucified and slain. Very well, that once, you see, you are face to face with a problem and with a mystery. And this is the first thing that we should always realize about this cross and about this death. You can stand there and look at it, as the people did when it took place, and you can completely misunderstand it. Indeed, it was not only the people, the common people and the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the others who misunderstood it. The apostles themselves had not understood it. And this is how you can see very clearly this element of mystery that is involved in the death on the cross. You remember how our Lord at uh, Caesarea Philippi, he had had to rebuke this very apostle Peter. He had asked his question, Whom do men say that I am? And then, Whom do ye say that I am? Peter stepped forward and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And our Lord had commended him and said, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Peter had acted as spokesman. He would recognized the person. But then you remember our Lord had gone on to tell them that he was going to die. That he was going to be taken and going to be condemned and put to death. And Peter rebuked him saying, Far be this from thee, Lord. The idea that he was going to die was abhorrent. 
And our Lord rebuked him, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savourest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Peter stumbled at this. He couldn't understand this person die. And indeed later. You will find that every time our Lord referred to his forthcoming death, the disciples, the apostles, were always offended. And when the time came for him to be arrested, they all forsook him and fled. And they were as bewildered as everybody else. They couldn't, more bewildered, they couldn't understand it. This was a puzzle to them, a problem, that he, who had done such mighty deeds, should nevertheless be taken in utter weakness, condemned, crucified, and there he was dying. The apostles had never understood it. Though they had come to see that he is the Son of God, and though they were his own intimate followers, they, looking at him dying upon the cross, they didn't understand what was happening. Very well, there is no need, is there a further proof of the fact that there is a mystery about this death? It, doesn't, it isn't simply what it appears to be. And the fact is that the apostles themselves didn't understand the meaning of the death upon the cross until after our Lord had arisen again and had appeared to them and had expounded the meaning of his death himself to them. You'll read the accounts of that in his various appearances after the resurrection. You remember the two men on the road to Emmaus. They hadn't understood it. We had thought, they said, that he was to be the one that was going to deliver us, but they've taken him and condemned him, and he's dead, and they were utterly disconsolate. Oh, fools, he says, and slow of heart to understand and to believe all that the prophets have written. Ought not the Christ to have died and suffered these things and enter into his glory? And then he took them right through the scriptures, expounding to them the meaning of his death and how it had to happen. But the point is that they hadn't understood that. They'd seen him dying, and they'd felt many things. But they didn't know why he died. They hadn't understood it at all. And it was only his own exposition of the scriptures after his resurrection that gave them the enlightening and the understanding. And then here comes the Holy Ghost upon them, and they see, and Peter preaches it with a holy boldness. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say this. Nobody can understand the meaning of this death without the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You can think of this cross and it may make you weep. You may like be the daughters of Jerusalem, the women that wept as they saw him staggering up with the cross heavily upon his shoulder. But that's not to understand it. He rebuked them. He said, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. You can say what a wonderful example of passive resistance. What a protest against war and armaments. But that doesn't mean you've seen the cross. You haven't started to see it. The natural men can never understand this. There's a mystery here. And it is such a mystery that nothing but the word of God has opened before us to minds enlightened by the Holy Spirit can possibly understand it. Very well, my friends, this is a very important first consideration, isn't it? Have you understood the meaning of the cross? Have you taken it in its biblical exposition? Have you had the unction of the Spirit? Has it been opened to you? Has the mystery been unraveled? Well, very well. Let's follow the exposition of this enlightened apostle who had been instructed in the meaning of this death by the risen Lord himself. What does he say? Well, he puts it like this. The first thing that is essential is, of course, that we are clear about the person. Him. Him. If we are not clear about the person, we cannot possibly understand his death. Him. Who is he? Well, he says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken. The person, I mustn't stay with this this morning, I have to take this for granted because of lack of time. But no one can possibly understand this death upon this cross who doesn't know that the person who was dying was 
the Son of God. Peter goes on to refer to him as the Holy One. He quotes the psalm, Neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. This is the one who worked the miracles, miracles, wonders, signs, the one who raised the dead, the one who calmed the storm, the one to whom nothing seemed to be impossible. Here he is, the signs, the miracles attest him. They proclaim who he is. He said, though ye believe not my words, believe the works. This is the Son of God. There is ever the starting point of it all. This is not only a man. He is a man, but he is God, God in the flesh. This, Peter says, you can't dispute it. You yourselves also know. You citizens of Jerusalem, he said, you men of Israel, he preached before you. He worked his miracles in your presence. You are, you are witnesses of these things. There he is, proclaiming. And now, of course, there was something further. And that was the resurrection. The final proof to the apostles himself, themselves that he is the Son of God, declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of Holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So this is the first part of the proclamation, that God's own Son has been in this world. The babe of Bethlehem is the Son of God and the creator of the universe. This man, this carpenter, he is not the son of Joseph, he is the Son of God. He's the one who was born of a virgin. He's the one who manifested his glory through his works of power, these amazing things. Son of God, him. Ah, oh, yes, but you see, here's the problem. The more I emphasize his Godhead and his deity and the miracles and the marvels and the signs, the more does the mystery increase. For here he is, nailed to a tree. In utter weakness. And he dies. And his body is taken down and is buried. You see, sir, somebody, you're increasing the mystery for me. The more you emphasize his deity and his God, the more I'm amazed. And the people were all amazed at this. Didn't they taunt him with it? Ah, oh, they said, thou that says that thou art the Son of God, come down from the cross. Save thyself. Thou who savest others, save thyself. Thou who sayest that thou art the king of Israel, manifest thy power, do something regal, you're dying in utter weakness. Now there's the problem, you see. The more we emphasize the Godhead, the more amazing is this fact that here he is, I say, in utter weakness and helplessness, crucified, obviously dying, expiring. Into thy hands I commend my spirit, and he died. And the body was taken down and was buried. Now what is this? Him, son of God. Well, why dying then? Why being crucified? What's the explanation? Well, you look again and you say, well, obviously this is the work of men. You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. If there's no problem, says somebody. This is the work of men. Men are responsible for this. The Jewish crowd cried out, saying, Away with him, crucify him. Ask for a man called Barabbas, a robber and a thief, to be set free. Away with this fellow. No, no, they said, we don't want him. Away with him, crucify him. They are responsible. They and these Roman authorities. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now we must examine this. Who does this ye refer to? Well, it refers to the men of Israel whom he is addressing. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you, you yourselves have taken the Jews. The leaders of the people, Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, doctors of the law, and the common people. But now we must be perfectly clear as to what Peter is saying about them. It's a very interesting statement, this. I'm reading the authorized version, and it says, Ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. But a better translation is this. Ye, by the hand of lawless men, did crucify and slay. 
It isn't wicked, it's lawless. That was the word that the apostle used. You, by the hand of lawless men, have crucified and slain. What does he mean by this lawless men? Well, he is referring, of course, to Gentiles. The Gentiles were without the law. They hadn't the law of Moses, so he very rightly calls them lawless men. So what he's saying is this. You, through the medium of men who are without the law, have taken him and have crucified and have slain him. In other words, Peter here is preaching directly to their consciences. He says, you men of Israel, you Jews, this is what you've done. You have taken your own Messiah whom God has sent to you. He prophesied his coming. He sent him at last. Your own Messiah has come to you. And you, you yourselves, have taken your own Messiah. You've handed him over to these lawless men, these Romans, this Pontius Pilate. What a terrible conviction. What a terrible charge to bring against them. They didn't recognize their own Messiah. They didn't know their own Savior. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. This is the tragedy. Did you notice it in the reading from John 19? Pilate was trying to hand him back to them, but they said, we don't want him. We have no power. We have no authority. They hand, kept on sending him back to Pilate. Yes, says Peter, you did it. You yourselves have handed him over to lawless men. Your own Messiah have handed him over to these godless, lawless Gentiles. You've done it yourselves. He is convicting them of the enormity of their sin. That was, I say, the great tragedy that these very people who'd been taught throughout the centuries to look for a coming Messiah failed to know him when he did come and thus dismissed him, sent him away, handed him over to these lawless men that they might crucify him and slay him. Now this word crucify is an interesting one. It isn't the word that's usually used for crucify. It's a very special word, and it's a word that brings out in a very dramatic manner the idea of fastening to. So he deliberately used it uh, to give the impression of the nails being hammered in. They fastened him. They fastened him to a tree. He is bringing it home to them that they may feel their guilt. He wants them to hear the sound of the hammer hammering every single nail into the body of their own Holy One, their own Messiah, the Son of God. You've handed him over to these lawless men and they've fastened him to. They've nailed him to the cross. Yes, and this word slay, which means to do away with. You despised him, said the apostle. You regarded him as but some unworthy fellow. You said, get away, get away with him, away with him, dismiss him. You got rid of him. And so you see the apostle is looking at the cross and getting them to look at it and says, what do you see there? Him, Son of God, Messiah. Rejected by his own people, handed over to the common hands of these lawless Romans and nailed and fixed to the tree and he dies. They've got rid of him. Well, there it is. Is that all? Is that the meaning of the death upon the cross? Is this just a story of the utter spiritual blindness of the Jews? Is it just a matter of politics on behalf of the Romans? You see the clever argument that the chief priests used with Pilate. They said, you know, if you don't put this man to death, you're not Caesar's friend. If you say this is the king of the Jews, if you say that there is any king except Caesar, you are being disloyal to your own master and he might have been reported and he might have lost his post as procurator. So Pilate decides to do it in order, well, it's a part of the game of politics. Is that therefore all that happened on that cross? Is it just the tragedy of a world that doesn't recognize its own greatest benefactor, the Jews blind to their Messiah, and the Romans, utterly ignorant of what was taking place and just playing that little power politics as usual, is it just the tragedy of mankind not recognizing a great religious genius or a great military or political leader, one who's come to reform the world and to put it in order? Is it just that? 
Is it just the action of men? Peter says it is the action of men. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Men have put him to death, though he is the Son of God. Is that all? Ah, here we come to the very heart of the mystery. I gave you the second half of Peter's statement before the first half, but this is what Peter said. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, he have taken, and by the hand of lawless men have crucified and slain. But what is this? There's something else here. And this is where the mystery comes in. You see, the apostles thought it was only men. The apostles thought it was the Pharisees and scribes and doctors of the law and the Romans. They thought it was the action of men. That's why they were disconsolate. And if you and I look at this cross and see nothing but men rejecting their Savior, crucifying a very wonderful person, we haven't started to understand the mystery of the cross. There is a mystery and a marvel here, and here it is. Him... Being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God's involved here. It isn't only men. God. Let's analyze the terms. Look at them. What's the meaning of this word counsel? Well, it means will. It means purpose. What is the meaning of this word determinate? Everybody's agreed it means determined. Predetermined. Him being delivered by the predetermined will and purpose and foreknowledge of God. What is foreknowledge? Well, it doesn't just mean that God knew beforehand that this was going to happen. No, no. It's a part of the purpose. It is a part of the will. It is a part of the thing that God decided. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Who has delivered? It means deliver up. It means hand over. Who has handed him over? Well, there's only one answer to this. It is God. He's been delivered up. He's been handed over by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. He hasn't been delivered up by men. He's been delivered up by God to men. That's the statement. Now, there can be no difficulty about this, surely. This is something that can be proved without any difficulty at all. If God had desired to prevent this death, he could have done it with extreme ease. The resurrection proves that. God is not only more powerful than men, he is more powerful than death. The last enemy, the strongest enemy, he brought him up from the dead. If God had been desirous of delivering his son from this death at the hands of men, there would have been no difficulty at all. Indeed, I've got the word of our Lord himself to prove this. Don't you remember when his own disciples were ready to defend him and Peter pulled out his sword? He said, put it back. He said, don't you know that I could command twelve legions of angels, not only to protect me, but to carry me to heaven without any difficulty whatsoever. That settles it, doesn't it? He was delivered up to this death by God, not by men. God handed him over to men according to his own predeterminate counsel and foreknowledge. Men have taken him, of course, but it's God who hands him over. The God who could have taken him to heaven without any difficulty. But he doesn't do that. He deliberately hands him over. Now, here, you see, is where the mystery of the cross comes in. This is the answer to the whole problem, to the enigma. But let us look at the statement first. This is what we are told. That God, the Almighty Father, deliberately handed over his only begotten Son to the spitting to the shame, to the condemnation, to the crown of thorns, to the nails being driven into his holy flesh one by one, to the thirst, to the agony, to the cry of dereliction. God, his Father, handed him over to that, delivered him up to that. 
sent him of set purpose to them. And let me expand it further. God had decided to send him to that before the very creation of the foundation of the world. Predeterminate will and purpose of God. Away back in eternity, God had decreed this very thing that's happened. That's what we are told. That's the Apostle Peter's explanation of the death upon the cross. The part of the men was a very subsidiary part. Thou couldest do nothing at all, as our Lord said to Pilate, except the power had been given thee from above. Don't exaggerate yourself and your self-importance, says our Lord to Pilate. You said that I'm in your hands. I'm in your hands in one sense only. In another, I'm not. Men did it with their hands, but whose purpose was it? And the answer is, it was God's. Men did the thing mechanically, but God handed him over to men. Him being delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Here is the question. Why did God do this? Why did our Lord set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem? They warned him. They said, that fox Herod is anxious to have you. They pleaded with him not to go. He said, I must go. He set his face steadfastly. He went deliberately, knowing that he was going to die. It's all deliberate. He knew. The Father sent him. Why is this? What is it that's happening here? Well, there is only one way to understand this great and tremendous mystery. This happened because obviously it had to happen. God the Father would never have sent his Son to such a death if it could in any way be avoided. And the answer is that it couldn't be. For what? Well, for this one and only reason. If a single soul is ever to be forgiven, that must happen. God is holy, God is righteous. God is of such a pure countenance that he cannot even look upon sin. How can he then forgive? God has said that the wages of sin is death, that the punishment of sin is death, physical and spiritual and separation from him. And that he will punish them. His justice, his righteousness, his holiness insist upon this. God is just. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He says that. He says he must. Sin must be punished. How can anybody be forgiven then? And this is the answer. Away back before time... And before the foundation of the world, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit met in that great council, considering fallen men, men in sin. And there, the plan was adumbrated and discussed and determined upon the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. There's only one way, and this is it. That the blessed Son, the second person in the Holy Trinity, should himself go down into earth and take on him human nature and become a man and become responsible for the sins of men, be subject to baptism made under the law. He's going to take it on himself, and he did. And what is happening there is that God is punishing your sins and mine in the person and the body of his only begotten Son. God delivers him up. Men actually do the crucifying, but it's God who's acting. Didn't you notice this extraordinary detail? That in the case of the other two who were crucified, they had to break their bones in order to kill them and get them out of the way in time. But when they came to our Lord, they found to their amazement he was already dead. Indeed, it wasn't men who killed him. What killed him? Oh, the separation from God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That broke his heart literally, and he died. Men only crucified him. What killed him, what caused his death, was the bearing of the punishment of your sin and mine. God hath made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
You see, the apostles didn't realize this. They looked on, they saw tragedy. Our Messiah die. What is this? Where's his strength? Where's the power that could raise the dead? Why doesn't he do something? They couldn't understand it. They were baffled and bewildered. They said, why doesn't he save himself? He could. Nobody could understand it. And you see, there is no understanding apart from this. He didn't want to. He'd come to die. He'd left heaven in order to taste death for us. He had come to make his soul an offering for sin. God had sent him that he might lay on him the iniquity of us all. It's God who's doing it. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Look at him. Look at the men who are hammering the nails. But at the back of it all, see the God who in eternity decided to deliver him up. To smite him. That we might be forgiven. That we might be reconciled. That we might become the sons of God. Don't misunderstand this, my friends. This is not in any way lessening the guilt of these men. Peter brings it home to them. He says, you men of Israel, you didn't know your own Messiah. You crucified him. You did it through these lawless men. And God will punish you. But you see, he did it. Why? In order that he might also forgive you. It's God's action. And not merely the action of men. Very well, I must leave you. I leave you with this mystery, the mystery of mysteries. The most marvelous and amazing thing that's ever happened. Look at him. Do you see the mystery? Look at him, what do you see? A man. Weakness. Yes, but look again. See God. Two natures in one person. Look at him again. There he is, dying. But who is he? Peter says in the next chapter, he's the prince, the author of life. He's the one through whom all things are made, and without him is nothing made that is made. The mighty creator died. What a mystery. The author of life died. Look again at that cross, what you see. Oh, this is what I see. Divine sovereignty. Human responsibility, both meeting together. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken sovereignty of God. Base action of men. But look again. What do I see there? Oh, I see the meeting place of divine justice and divine love. As an old psalmist that put it, mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. They've met together. The absolute justice of God. Yes, and the absolute love of God. The paradoxes are endless. The mystery, the marvel, has no end to it. But you know the greatest mystery of all? The greatest mystery of all to me is this. That God should have decided and determined before the very foundation of the world to send his only begotten, dearly beloved Son to that for me, for you. Upon that cross of Jesus, Mine eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me and from my smitten heart with tears. Two wonders, I confess. The wonder of his glorious love. And my own worthlessness. Those are the two wonders. The wonder of his glorious love. The wonder of my own worthlessness. The mystery. The marvel. The wonder of the cross of Christ. Have you seen it?
Do you sometimes see by faith upon that cross of Jesus the very dying form of one who suffered there for me? And do you go on to say, and from my smitten heart with tears, two wonders I confess, the wonder of his glorious love and my own worthlessness. Have you seen the wonders? Have you felt the wonders? Have you smitten yourself? Has it ever broken your heart? It should, my friends. And the Holy Spirit alone can give us such an understanding as to lead to that. Have you been broken by this cross? Have you felt your utter, absolute unworthiness? Have you seen that all your righteousness is but as filthy rags? If you have any vestige of self-righteousness left in you, you have never seen the meaning of this cross. To see the wonder of his glorious love and the love of the Father that decreed it and sent him to it. The wonder of his glorious love and my own worthlessness. May God by his Spirit open our eyes to the wonder, the marvel, the amazement of the cross. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.